You are listening to part two of three of our continuing conversation with Alan Green. Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Alan Abadessa Green. Sabelle and Chipper will be joining our conversation. Alan is an author, researcher, and editor of Sync Book 1, Myths, Magic, Media, and Mindscapes, and Sync Book 2, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. Both books explore synchronicity and synchromysticism through the writings of authors within the Sync community. Alan is well-versed in contemporary myths, memes, and synchronicities, revealing amazing insight into ourselves, our culture, and our world. ThinkBook Radio features two weekly podcasts, 42 minutes, and always record with an archive of conversations and interviews with some of the most intriguing minds. Additionally, Alan is the author of a blog titled, Look at All the Happy Creatures, in his soon-to-be-released book, Suicide Kings. We're going to move on to the topic of current and contemporary memes and syncs. Hi, Alan. This is Chipper. I've got a question about what you have talked about previously, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and ask this question because I think it, it ties in, in with it about if you could, uh, I don't know, give give your take on the flavor you have of, of the current zeitgeist the 2013 zeitgeist and how you're seeing that reflected in the memes and the the myth reformings and and poppings up and and the sync wings i uh, where we might need to focus on or or where we might look to see how that might affect us and and personally impact us well, uh, my hopeful answer would be that, well, I guess it's, it's both hopeful and realistic, so I'll, I'll just give you my full answer. <laughs> um, there's, there's definitely, the veil is, is falling, if you know what I mean. Um, we come up at the end of, like, the, the quote-unquote end of the Mayan calendar, right? was supposed to be the Mayan apocalypse. Well, what does the word apocalypse actually mean? Uh, the word, yes, the unveiling. Uh, what would the end of the Mayan calendar, the, the Maya, Maya means illusion, right? Right. Um, not, 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 not to the, the, the Mayan culture, um, but as just sort of playing with the, the, the phraseology here. So we have the the end of the the uh, illusion that there is a calendar that there that there, that the things are linear uh, to one extent, um, we can sort of see all this sort of stuff playing out. I mean, the 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 resignation of a pope at this time is pretty fascinating, uh, considering you know considering all this. It's like yeah, it's like the end of illusion that the, that someone else will be able to give us the answers and, and jumping into a more directly felt experience with all of it. Right. Uh, that's, you know, that's the sort of hopeful side of it. Um, but at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm the guy who's always cautiously optimistic uh, to say that none of these things happen smoothly. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the fact that the, the death of JFK and uh, Martin Luther King and 9-11 and, and all these things seem to tie directly into psychedelic explorations, that they seem to tie directly into these ego deaths and these, these leaps for human understanding is in one sense very unfortunate th- that it should happen in this sort of violent and you know horribly unpleasant 
strife is is just a, a sort of harsh truth of how these things play play out. You know, this is regardless of of who plans to kill JFK or who plans to kill Martin Luther King or who plans to take the t- towers down. You you also have this element that's they're just pawns in this sort of cosmic stage play anyway you know i I don't think that the cia is is behind it i think they're just as much of a pawn in all this as as any of us uh so the idea that we would the things that we would be aware of the things that we can kind of point to are these uh very often violent weeps speaks to something else that uh, i think i think we spoke about this on our when, when we did the uh time monk show was the idea that if this all seems to symbolize a sort of ego death on a collective scale, not everyone's going to handle that easily. Right. And, uh, and usually no one handles that easily. <laughs> uh, let's, let's put it that way. No one handles that easily. But some, some less, uh, less smoothly than others, let's say. You know, there, there have been uh, cases throughout history where ergot poisoning of entire towns, I don't know if you're familiar with this, like yeah. the, some people think that like the Salem witch trials were a result of the entire town uh, suffering ergot poisoning, where ergotized rye uh, is basically a psychedelic fungus that grows on rye plants, right. uh, and that everyone in the town would essentially be tripping and they would start to you know point fingers and you'd have these witch hunts and they wouldn't be able to explain what's going on there have been cases uh of this through throughout history other other cases of ergot poisoning and then you have also uh instances of the cia actually going and you know aerosol spraying lsd sure. on entire hunts too so uh wh- however it happens though <laughs> whether it's naturally caused by ergot poisoning or unnaturally caused by the CIA, uh, the results are, are pretty similar, is that people don't know how to handle it. They're, they're so used to consensus reality that they are not really able to handle these altered states, and it very often leads to panic, uh, to violence, and it leads to... Uh, a lot of times backpedaling where, you know, you end up further grounded in these fundamentalist uh, ideals right. where, you know, oh, this thing is happening. It must be the devil's doing it or witchcraft or whatever. And we do see this happening right now where I, I see there is a, a form of witch hunts. And it's, it's happening on multiple levels. The The people who are completely in the church of science are witch hunt they have their own little witch hunt for anybody you know from the you know the most innocent new age spiritualist to the uh bible thumping christian they're in the targets of the militant atheists and those who you know who feel like it's their duty to go and uh, make sure god is dead and at the same time you also have the you know christians I, I, there's something that i see particularly within the conspiracy culture is there is a heavy Christian influence in the conspiracy culture. And I yes. think, you know, a lot of times people don't like to commit to, to, to accept that or, or whatever. But, yeah, you, you, it's a pretty undeniable that there's a really strong Christian influence in, in the conspiracy culture. So what you have is, you know, when people talk about aliens, that they can turn that into a conversation of demonic entities, you know, or uh, they can paint anything having to do with any... Like when, when if I talk about Kabbalah or Tarot or even like Masonry, I'm not anti-Masonry. I, I'm I'm against the elitist structure of it. I'm I'm against a lot of things that have been done by people affiliated with it. But I'm not particularly anti-Masonry. Uh, at least you know they're the, the the system of of mysteries that they're studying. I actually have a, a good amount of sympathy for what I think a lot of the people who go into that, uh, the reasons they go into that. So regardless, the, this, uh, the Christian influence on the conspiracy culture is definitely uh, influencing this discussion where everything's Illuminati, everything is, you know, the Masons are bad, uh, this is, you know, if something's to do with Kabbalah, then, you know, they're somehow tied to Jewish bankers or, you know, something like that. And it's like they're really distorted the conversation and brought it 
down to a really ugly and simple-minded conversation. So there's witch hunts happening on that level as well. And unfortunately, this is, you know, this is our destiny. And hopefully, you know, hopefully some of us figure that out and figure out how to navigate that. But, uh, you know, Terrence McKenna, who for, you know, whatever you could say about what happened at the end of 2012 or whatever was, you know, he thought was a possibility, that man was really freaking spot on that he could pinpoint this time as a time of, un like, you would not be able to recognize... Maximum novelty. The, yeah. yeah. I mean, the fact that, you know, if you... It, and then the fact that it amplified so quickly that, you know, with technology, the fact that we are an Internet-based, media-based culture that, you know, if you took your iPhone back 10 years, people would not know what the hell it is, uh, <laughs> let alone 100 years. There's the fact that we have access to so much information and then the fact that we use this information, like, it really is a maximum novelty. We have access to, you know, the, the greatest access to information in the history of humankind. And we look at pictures of cats falling into toilet bowls and, you know, uh, Gangnam style videos going viral. It is maximum novelty. Everything is, like, is on equal footing. The Pope resigning is gets reduced down to a tweet, you know? Hey, guess what? <laughs> the Pope resigned. Guess what? We found the Higgs boson. Guess what? You know, some actress's nipple fell out. Guess what? And it's like, it's all just sort of gets equal standing. It gets all about five seconds of attention from everybody and then move right on. There's so much happening that we, we've hit this sort of maximum flux of, of information. Almost like um, we're intermingling with our myths and shredding them. Yeah, yeah. By personalizing so, their what, what they would have told us <laughs> about the society and ourselves right. it's 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 fascinating i mean like we live in a really interesting time uh to to say the least but i guess the other thing i wanted to, to point out is terence mckenna made this this point that said you know people were asking him something and uh he said he had this this line where he said basically of course there's going to be war. Of course there's going to be genocide. Of course there's going to be violence and strife and struggle. He said, you know, every evolutionary weep is made in the face of struggle and conflict. He said, if man is going to take to the stars, you're not going to orderly and quietly line up and pack your suitcase and get onto the starship cruise liner. You're going to you know, go into these outer reaches because you're compelled to do so by the nature of what's going on around you. And that's a sort of haunting little little bit of prescience there as well, because we are definitely in a in an age where we have all this media and don't know how to navigate it. We have all this information, don't know how to navigate it. And then we also have that it's it's unbalanced. Like we're you know we have moments where we think, oh my God, we're we're so far advanced as a society that we can do all this stuff. But this is also completely biased first world perspective. Most people around the world don't have iPhones. They don't have access to this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, to be honest, I don't have an iPhone either. But uh, I'm just Me saying, too. like, <laughs> good for you. Um, you know. I'm sure it makes life convenient in one respect, but um, well, whatever. So it's like this is – its we have these sort of first world luxury that we can't even be having this philosophical question of what does it mean to be so saturated by media and how do we navigate it. There's people who are still figuring out how to get you know indoor plumbing, uh, not to have uh, water that is that is tainted. Right. Uh, of course, we, we here in America have our water tainted with fluoride and stuff, but it's probably a little less, uh, I don't know, I guess fluoride still preferable to, you know, feces and bacteria and things like that. So Dumb, Dumb's better than dead. <laughs> <laughs> something like that, yeah. So, again, what? it's just this idea of that we, we we have this luxury that we can even have this conversation and we also expect that... But, but at the same time, we don't realize 
how far we've changed our way of thinking so quickly. And it, it, the using the internet, just using the internet daily or every few days, I mean, this is definitely changing the way we think. Just like every, you know, bit of media, this is the Marshall McLuhan thing, right? You know, introducing the TV, how does this change the way that human beings relate to each other in the world around them? The same way that he said the printing press changed the way people related to each other in the world around them. Isn't oh. it every time you get a, a uh, an expanding of the framework with which you view it changes, every time it expands or or clashes with another and they have to come to some sort of agreement to, to get along. Uh, it That sounds to me like what's happening now is we just really expanded our frameworks and we're putting them all out there together at the same time and we're saying, what's this mean and what's this mean? Yeah, which in, in, in one extent I, I really appreciate. Like, you know, if you look at the printing press and the radio and the television, these are all controlled forms of media where there's either a TV station or, you know, there's a media monopoly that can essentially tell you what you're going to intake. Uh, they control what you're, you're eating, let's say, or what media you're consuming. With the Internet, we have freedom of choice to an extent where I can go to CNN.com if I want my mainstream news or I can go to any number of websites uh, to get my news. Uh, yeah, obviously there's, you know, someone says seemingly, yeah, um, you know, obviously there's, there, uh, that, that's, that's a finer point that we could address, but um, my point is, you could go to the website where you want to see cats falling into toilet bowls. You don't have to look at the news at all if you don't want to. You could make your own website, which is all about uh, Anderson Cooper falling into the toilet bowl. You could do whatever you want. And this, this to a certain extent, gives us a, a total media freedom that we don't know, that we've never experienced before. That not only can we choose what media we consume, but we can also choose what media we create. Just like we're all doing right now, right? We're creating media by this recording. Right. Um, so... You know, in that respect, it's it's a it's a fascinating new frontier, and at the same time, we're like you know prepubescent teenagers playing with cosmic genitalia for the first time, trying to figure out what the hell to do with it. We have these most amazing technologies, the most amazing freedom, and also at the same time, we're sort of spastically schizophrenic about you know should we clamp down? Should we censor this? Should we go in this direction and you know does this mean you know we're just sort of all over the place and it's this is the new frontier this is going to be a struggle but it's also i, I do remain fairly optimistic about it because i am someone who I, again i don't think everyone around the world and you know the conversation we had before we were recording goes to show you not everyone's on the same page not everyone's at the same um you know same page in the playbook here right. but uh uh, as far as development goes, but I, I think I have enough faith that my, my personal politics, which I don't usually bring, you know, straight up politics into it, but I I do consider myself an anarchist. Um, I do think that ultimately it's about the, a sovereign individual is the best thing we can have, and these tools are the first step to a culture where we can all be essentially sovereign. But it requires, just like on a personal level, true sovereignty requires a tremendous amount of personal effort and self-discipline. Well, so too will the age of this kind of freedom will have to come with a lot of personal responsibility and figuring out what to do. Because if you, you don't take responsibility for your actions, uh, if we don't figure out how to navigate this future, we, we, we'll be wiped out in a wash of idiotic internet memes and political genocides and drones and all sorts of stuff, you know? Right. So we just have to, this is a great opportunity for all of us as individuals, but it's going to be tough. Do you see that being played out in, in new mything, in new myths? Because that seemed to be how 
the values we hold as individuals and how we learn to be who we are, you know, how to be sovereign individuals, uh, was transmitted by that technique for thousands of years. I mean, they didn't come up overnight like it's happening with the Internet, but it, it informed a worldview. It informed a, a way of living in the world. Do you see that type of new formation occurring once this chaotic transition period might slow down? If it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, it's funny, like the whole idea of new mythology, That's a. it's just a really excellent qu- question. It's not something I really have an answer for. It's something I'm trying to figure out yeah. is... Um, we all if, are. If new, yeah, yeah. Is there a way to break the cycles? You know, is there a way? Like this is sort of how this we started today's conversation, right? This idea of repeating archetypes and do they does they does that stop repeating? And my thing is like, well, perhaps we can, if we understand what the basic elements are, we can reorganize them, right? So we have these basic building blocks. Yes, there's going to be. You know, this is going to play out and that's going to play out. However, maybe we can't write a totally new script, but maybe we can sort of reorganize or restructure that into such a way. If, if that if that makes sense. Um, sure, sure. Operating even, manual even, for the human OS. Yeah. Now, but my other thing is even from a less lofty goal, just as a as an artist, as someone like I, I like to write fiction. I'm at a point where I don't, I don't even know. I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to tell a new story. You know, um, I, I tr- I've tried, and then it's like no matter what, you're essentially it's like it's the realization. This is one of the things that confirms for me this kind of uh, viewpoint is that it's almost impossible to tell a story that doesn't tap into this. And and it's the question of is can we at least learn to restructure them? Um, like because I I see no I have no interest in just it's like this idea of oh okay these archetypes play out the same way and we're basically telling the same story over and over again throughout all of history. Well, then what the hell is the point of me writing another fictional story if it's just going to be if I'm just going to tell the same thing? So you make these efforts to try and do something new. And you realize that your unconscious, let's say, or whatever you're tapping into, whatever your muse is, uh, you know, sort of still puts in there these other pieces of it. So this is an excellent question. And I, I think, I think well, we're, it's a sort of postmodern dilemma. <laughs> uh, there's a guy, I would direct you to a guy named Jeffrey Kripal. Dr. Jeffrey Kripal has this book called mutants and mystics and they've actually interviewed him on uh, 42 minutes a few times uh doug and will have interviewed him a few times and this guy has this really interesting theory he is basically uh showing how there are what we might consider almost like memes or tropes uh throughout history there are these periods where all our fiction uh plays out these like really kind of focuses on one thing. So like we had a point where all our, you know, superheroes got their powers from atomic bombs. You know, the incredible Hulk gets a bomb dropped right. on him and he turns into a superhero. And, spiders. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it was all radiation. This is the next stage of power. This is what we can imagine. So everything's radiation. And that, and that's, that's how we envision our evolutionary leap. And then you get to an age of genetics, where suddenly it's like, oh, we can genetically engineer the perfect person, or you have cybernetics. And you have like all this sort of stuff where you're, he's tracking these themes or, or focuses, but something he, when he takes it, that sort of zoom out, uh, giving the, you know, the example of like an atomic superpowers or something, but right. when you take that sort of zoom out, he ha- shows these stages, and um, what seems to be is that you have almost like you would have a personal development, there is this collective development. Right. And it shows as, as evidenced by what we're all sort of focused in writing about at any specific time. 
and he shows that right now uh, the, the most previous the most recent phase of fiction that we exited was this sort of Gnostic phase of realizing that you're in the story, that you are the character in the story. And then the stage directly after that is authorization, where you write your own story. Right. So, But first you have to realize you are the character in the story, that you're stuck in this sort of you know loop of, of archetypes playing out. And then the next step is to become your own author and write your own future. And this is going to be our struggle. But again, it is definitely our opportunity as well. So, um, Isn't that I, the new book that has never been written is the one that you or I write? I mean, yeah, absolutely. how we tell our story in relation absolutely. to everything that we are ensconced in? It's the book of life, right? It's like you're... It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's how you write your own future. Right. This is another reason why I'm so reluctant to get into the uh, future prediction business is because I want to, I, I don't want to be able to t find out what's going to happen in the future. I want to be the guy who shapes my own future. There you go. And that's, that's much more interesting to me and actually a lot more difficult learning how to write your own future, make your life as good as you want it to be, um, live the life you want, and and be a sovereign individual. While, you know, of course you're going to have to recognize external forces that you have no control over. You know, sure. we could, I think there is an importance to that. Uh, recognizing your environment is, is, is highly important. But, but taking back some personal power and understanding that the opportunities you have to influence your future, to influence your life, and to live the life that you really want to live to the best of your ability is a huge struggle and opportunity, and, and I, I'm excited to do it. And I, I wish I wish you the best of luck writing your future, just as I wish myself the best of luck writing my own. I think we got us a couple of bestsellers. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I You had a post uh, on Angry Children. Uh, the Child of Mars, and I w was wondering if you could just discuss what you were working with there. Okay, well, that was that was about like some of these, uh, you know, shootings and things like that, like the movie theater shootings, and but it kind of ties in. I mean, we discussed all these the, the meteors and the external little tangents that you can pull from that, but right. I think it does speak to this idea of. The frustration, um, to one extent, it's the frustration of almost like angry children. I mean, what is that really saying? You know, when I say we're like prepubescent fools fumbling through this right now, we haven't quite got it figured out. Well, so as I said, you know, you have some people who lash out. You're going to have the toddler's temper tantrum. Um, but Acting out, yeah. Acting out, Sure. And there's this idea of, you know, in a sense, in a in a, in a very dark sense. I, I hope I hope this this comes across the right way. This is these children attempting to have that authorization process, right? Right. And I, I don't. That's not a, not a healthy way, obviously. And I, I hope I don't have to really stress that. But uh, I think we all know what I'm saying. This is an attempt to take back some personal power. If you're feeling helpless, they're like, well, screw it. I can show that I have some sort of personal power. I have some sort of say in this. And the fact that they, like, the fact that this guy would go to a movie theater to do it is so poetically perfect in, in a really dark sense. I, you know, I don't a taking think about to the that. stage, right? Yeah, taking to the stage... You know, this is like the, the movie theater is Plato's cave, right? This is right. like, you know, where you're, you're going into this, this land of illusion and they're attempting to shatter that world. They're trying to take control in some way. They're obviously not uh, aware and they're not doing it in a healthy fashion. But this but is the almost, reason I say this. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it almost sounds, you know, I'm, I'm hearing uh, the in that acting out, they're using the framework within which they come to awareness of themselves in order to break out of that framework. I, 
Mm. That's not a fully formed thought yet. So this. No, no, I, I, I do know. Yeah, I do know exactly. I, I think I think that's actually, and that's why where I was going with, like, I started that that blog post. I started with a sort of, you know, almost. I don't. I don't see what I, was, I say here. Uh, take a good look at your Aeon of Horus, the New American Century. You know, there's a sort of anger on on my part is to say this is the if we're only teaching our children these methods of self empowerment, then this is the future that we deserve, right? Um, right. We're we're gonna get. We, we have to sort of wake up to that. Is that we can. We, we definitely are influencing people and, uh, you know, this idea, this is one of the things I really, really struggle with in my research is, and I think we talked about this last time, this idea that all media, in a, in a sense, is in this fractal holographic sense, it's all quote-unquote perfect, right? There's no, there's no way to not be an emanation of the Godhead. Right. Uh, whether, you know, whether it's Lady Gaga or, you know, Beyonce or what, you know, or a uh, Fast and the Furious movie or you know, some gar- like total pop garbage. It's like impossible to not be an emanation of this world, um, you know, in all its beauty and horror. In that sense, it's, it's, it's really hard is like, OK, everything is to an extent kind of perfect or the only you know as as perfect as it can be and at the same time there's this idea of but what are we choosing to nurture is it is there a way to quantify if it's all kind of the same thing but is there something that's preferable uh is there something we should praise more than others and that's a really you know a sort of uh there are days when i get really zen and i try and uh, you know, play that out in my head and, and wrestle with that. But I think on a sort of practical level, there is an answer to that. The answer is, you know, if we show our kids that, um, you know, we're, if they go to a movie theater and they have to sit through a three-minute commercial for the army, I mean, what does that say? You know, and then they're going to watch some violent shoot up movie. Now, I'm not trying to, like, blame media. I'm, I'm usually a guy who... Uh, you know, defends media as a last bastion of, of you know, artistic opportunity. Right. Um, but at the same time, uh, uh, just, to, just to quickly say, the whole idea of, like, does media influence people in a negative way? There's something that I also come back to. Frank Zappa had a thing years ago when they were doing the PMRC hearings. They were trying to, like, put uh, censor labels or, like, parental warnings yeah. on uh, music and uh, Frank Zappa had this great quote. He said, if music really influences people, you know, to do something, then we would live in this great world because 90 percent of the songs are love songs. And obviously we're not going around loving each other. So that's the effectiveness of media influencing society, <laughs> which is a, which is a sort of interesting point in itself. But uh, at the same time, I guess what I'm saying is like we do have a culture to be sure, we have a culture that praises certain things and values certain things. And our, our media is definitely an expression of that. And, um, and just, you know, sort of everything that we do is like where we, we have all experienced it where, you know, you, you could be you and I right now in our social standing would probably everyone would think, wow, you know, if we were like lawyers or a CEO or something, everyone would envy our, you know, Porsches and Ferraris and our, you know, and everyone would be like, oh, so proud of my son for being a lawyer or something. But at the same time, why are we valuing, you know, predatory nature? Why are we, uh, you know, is there not a way to be a good person and still be an active part of society? This is where I think, like, we still have a lot of development to do. And media is a, a sort of interesting question mark in this, in this conversation. But definitely our culture right now is focused on this theme. And at the same time, 
let's take this back to the idea of how archetypes play out and all this sort of stuff. I'll get off my little political soapbox for a moment <laughs> and just say 9-11 – if if you all right, if you go just, let's go back before nine eleven. You have Alistair Crowley. Who we, you know we spoke of this idea of the seven 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 and the ninety three and all this sort of stuff. He's been inc- more influential on the last century than most people give him credit for. But one of the things that he touches on is this idea of the uh, Aeon of Horus. Right, this would be the sort of next uh, age that we step into, right. and uh, Horus. He that he's sort of equating him with this, um, you know, as this, this god of war, as, as Horus was. He's the this sort of child that that seeks vengeance for his father and all this sort of stuff. And as for what Crowley might have meant by that, I mean, he he sort of like any good religious, you know, author sort of plays it both ways. That sometimes this is an age of peace and sometimes it's an age of war and all this sort of stuff. But regardless, I, I think he actually was was right in a sense is that this is definitely he, – he zeroed in on the, the type of energy that we're going to see play out here. Now, I would direct your attention to um, what's known as the Babylon working. This was Jack Parsons and uh, L. Ron Hubbard trying to raise a moon child. This was another bit of ceremonial magic that happened in the last century. You know, Jack Parsons, of course – directly responsible for, you know, much of NASA as we as it now stands, right? We still have Jet Propulsion's laboratory was started by Jack Parsons. Mm-hmm. L. Ron Hubbard goes on to form the Church of Scientology. This is a highly influential people. Right. Well, they did a, a bit of uh, virtual magic, which they called the Babylon working, and they were trying to create a moon child. Uh, the, there's a whole rabbit hole we could go down with that, right? But just to say... If you read Jack Parsons' text, he wrote this, what's known as the Book of Babylon, or uh, Lieber 49, and he sort of explains what his personal intentions were uh, in this. It's really interesting. He um, could probably pull it up if you give me a second, but basically he, um, he lays out this idea that the, the energy of Horus, of this age, is that of a violent child if it's not properly harnessed. And just like any adolescent has to learn how to tame their own nature and and to kind of take responsibility for themselves, he saw that as uh, the one of the things that we would really have to figure out to do in this coming age uh, would be to you know, take some personal responsibility and to figure out how to tame this really powerful, but also, if not properly controlled, very violent energy that would dominate the the, the current age that we're we're stepping into. Right. Sorry, I'm trying to pull this up. I have it here. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is his introduction to the Book of Babylon. Parsons writes. This book contains the record of a magical experiment relating to the invocation of an elemental, the thereafter the goddess or fortress called Babylon, and the results thereof. The content should be clear enough to those who are prepared for understanding, and a little study and effort should make it so for those who desire understanding. For the rest, each will no doubt interpret it in accord with his own predilections. A note on the underlying philosophy. The present age is under the influence of the force called, in magical terminology, Horus. This force relates to fire, Mars, and the sun, that is, to power, violence, and energy. It also relates to a child being innocent, i.e. undifferentiated. Its manifestations may be noted in the destruction of old institutions and ideas, the discovery and liberation of new energies, and the trend towards power governments, war, homosexuality, infantilism, and schizophrenia. This force is completely blind, depending on the men and women in whom it manifests and who guide it. Obviously, its guidance now tend towards catastrophe. The catastrophic trend is due to our lack of understanding of our own natures, the hidden lusts, fears, and hatreds resulting from the warping of the love urge, which underlies the natures of all Western peoples, have taken a homicidal and suicidal direction. This impasse is broken by the incarnation of another sort of force called Babylon. The nature of this force relates to love, understanding, and Dionysian freedom. 
and is the necessary counterbalance or correspondence to the manifestation of Horus. It is indicated this force is actually incarnate in some living woman as the result of the described magical operation. A more basic matter, however, is the indication that this force is incarnate in all men and women and needs only to be invoked to free the spirit from the debris of the old Aeon and to direct the blind force of Horus Horus, into constructive channels of understanding and love. Now, bear in mind, this man wrote this in 1946, and he's saying we have this uh, sort of solar, right? Horus is this sort of sun god. Uh, we have this sort of warlike, I mean, very little, literally, what do, we, what do we in the West, we call it like a hawkish nature, right? Horus, right. Horus is a hawk, this sort of warlike nature uh, connected with the sun. And we have this sort of thing. Now, he writes this in 1946 saying there will be, we have to unleash some sort of Dionysian counterbalance to this. Uh, that and he lists all the things that would come along with that. Well, of course, we go to the '60s where we have this sort of Dionysian explosion of people who are trying to harness all these opposite sides of that. And uh, there's a guy. I think um, I, I hope I don't have this wrong, but I, I think it's Wilhelm Reich who who, who argued that uh, you'll see throughout uh, throughout history that you always have this playing out of either Dionysus and Apollo, these sort of two energetics, sort of that when one emerges, the other will respond to it. And so Apollo was the god of the sun. We can sort of equate uh, what Jack Parsons is calling the Aeon of Horus. This would be argued as being an Apollo sort of force. So here we are, if, if we take this into consideration, that this does seem to be pretty accurate. Now, whether or not we want to go down the rabbit hole of his actual ritual invocation of this sort of stuff, the philosophy behind it is, is fascinating, and it's particularly in, in the sense that it was very um, accurately predicted how things were going to play out. It was a good assessment of, of where they were at and where it was going. You know, he's writing this in the midst of uh, atomic bombs and, and right. shit like that. So... Uh, now here we are. And he's we're writing in about the collective unconscious. Absolutely, sense. yes. So in, in this sense, I, I think there's really something to this. In one respect, we could see that the Dionysian angle is not uh, it's not completely ideal either. It, you, it can be unbalanced. Uh, I think actually in our last segment, the, the segment we did uh, a month or so ago back in January. Uh, we, we talked a little about this, right, this idea of um, the Dionysian cults and how they were aware that they could lead themselves into hedonism, schizophrenia, all this sort of stuff, the same things right. that Parsons is warning about. So we, we have this idea. I, you could sort of take it even to our conversation of the left brain, right brain. You know, we have this sort of like order, this, you know, order at all costs, almost fascist left brain and the completely you know, uh, wild right, right brain or Dionysian angle that either one, if they can go to their extremes, are very ugly. Right. I guess where I'm going with this is that we do see that this chorus energy, this angry child energy is really prevalent right now. And at the same time, we see this, these people who are trying really hard, and I count us among them, the people in this conversation among them, people who are really trying to liberate ourselves. So this would be the Dionysian angle. And hopefully what we'll do is find some sort of balance. But uh, and to be realistic, a, a certain amount of clash is inherent in the archetypes. Thank you. It's always such a uh, expanding conversation talking about this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, um, to tie in um, something you said about violent energies a little bit ago, have you looked into or investigated the artwork at the Denver airport? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. There's um, all the, the crazy murals. Holes. There's a few things there, yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm aware, absolutely. I was just kind of curious of your thoughts on that and the horse that's out front um, that looks kind of odd. And there's, uh, isn't there also the road is like Pina Road or something, and they found that the, the actual road around the airport leading out is shaped like a, a penis and testicles? It's actually oh, I didn't know pen- that. <laughs> yeah. 
take <laughs> to if you look at the road around the airport and what leads out, it's called like Pina Road, P N A or something, and it's actually shaped like a penis. It's kind of kind of funny. That whole airport seems like some weird joke, doesn't it? Right? Like it's like we're missing the punchline here. Is um, yes. the whole thing is so so bizarre, uh, and it sort of seems like someone's screwing with us. Um, do you remember? Uh, Oh, what was it? Um, was it you guys I was speaking to about um, the the 2012 Olympics? I think that was. Yes, right? yes, it yeah, was. Us. Yeah, we were talking about the 2012 Olympics, and I um, I hate that I keep doing this to you guys. I don't know if you're you're you have sensitive ears, uh, but I, I called the 2012 Olympics a mind fuck. You know, it's the idea that mm-hmm. like, there, it was it was a joke. It's like, oh, you want a conspiracy? We're going to throw everything at you at once and what's what's going to happen and people freaked out and obviously nothing really happened uh and i i call like you know not to be like oh i called that but to say like that seemed like a someone's screwing with you like there comes a point where it's like mm, that seems like you're being baited there's something about the denver airport which makes me feel the same way there's if you look into there is like a, a freemasonic stone there but it's De- it uh, says it's placed by a lodge that doesn't actually exist. Like if that lodge isn't a real lodge. There's like you know, just the whole thing is 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 super bizarre. But I have a personal synchronicity with it. I got married in 2010 on September 2nd, and my wife and I were going to take a uh, flight out to California for our honeymoon. And we were looking around at different flights, and, you know, it's a really cheap day to fly. 9-11, I guess a lot of people don't like to fly on 9-11. So we're like, hey, you know, that's about a week or so after our wedding. Let's just fly out for our honeymoon then. So we fly out on 9-11, we end up having a layover at Denver International Airport. And I'm like, stand there, and I'm like, how weird is this that I'm in this airport on 9-11, Right. Like it's just it's just too weird. So I'm just I'm just kind of laughing to myself and looking around the place and just like taking it all in and trying to make some sense of it. I guess so we then we get on our plane. We're only there for like you know a few hour layover, and we get on our plane and head out to California. And as soon as we get there, we get invited to a dance, and we're like, okay, sure, you know. Basically, got right off the plane and got invited to go to this uh, this dance thing, and where is it being held? But at like a Masonic lodge. And I was like, this is too weird how I'm spending my 9-11 in Denver International Airport in a Masonic Lodge. Really bizarre, unexpected. But there was something only from a personal synchronicity level that I just, like not to take away anyone's research or anything like that, but there's something almost that it seems like a joke and that my own personal experience with it just made me like laugh where it was almost like, a really, is this real? Uh, is this really how I'm spending my my day and traveling to my honeymoon? And everything sort of had this weird air to it that I feel that I don't really feel threatened by it. It feels almost like a like a joke. Uh, I don't I don't mean to take any you know the, the, any potential seriousness out of it, but I, I it feels essentially harmless to me. I, I don't I don't that's that's my just just my off the cuff impression. Okay, I was just curious what you thought. Um, thank you. But if you want to talk, you know, we could talk about the the symbolism behind it is is just you know really fascinating in those murals and all that all that artwork. It's it really is very very interesting. But uh, oh sure, yeah. If you want to give us your thoughts on the symbolism, I'd like to hear it. Sure. Okay. Um, I it's, I see someone put a link here to some of the uh, photos. I haven't looked them in a while, but I know there's like the guy in the gas mask. This idea of um, bending the plowshares, all this sort of stuff. I hope this doesn't screw up my Skype. I'm going to try and open this link. There's something really interesting in one of the last images, as I recall, of these sort of like glass case coffins. Mm-hmm. You know I saw them? that, yes. Oh, okay, here. Now, uh, one of the photos that comes up here, exactly. So this idea of the New World Airport Commission... This this Masonic Lodge here, like it's like oh, just sort of like weirdly, um, just sort of weirdly like fake um, and sort of in your face. That that's that's just so bizarre. 
I haven't looked at this in a few years, I'm going to be honest with you, but this is really interesting. You will well, find it, a lot of, oh, sorry, sorry, you ahead. will find a lot of the same, same type stuff at the United Nations, uh, which, you know, shows you what sort of company, it, it's hard because this stuff, you can very easily see how this could be a, in a weird way, a well-intentioned idea here of someone saying, you know, acknowledging that we're coming out of all this war, like the, the idea of showing these like horrific, you know, children being killed and, you know, this sort of like giant like Nazi gas mask swordsmen and all this sort of stuff is, you know, could just be a an acknowledgement, a, a very honest assessment of human history, right? And a And a hope for something brighter. You see, with, when it comes to things like this, what I, what I sort of have to remind myself of, uh, I, you know, I, I wrote this book called Look at All the Happy Creatures, and it's a really dark, dystopian future. I wrote it at the height of my conspiracy phase, and it's super, super dark, and it's showing, you know, sort of how bad it can get and then hopefully how we can try and turn some of that around. And what's interesting is as I put this out, like I said, I'm at the height of my conspiracy stuff, and then I start hearing all these conspiracy shows talking about how these movies that, were, that came out that also featured dystopian futures, and they said, ah, they're showing you the future that the New World Order wants. Like this is like some sort of New World Order wet dream that you're going to see in this in this movie. I don't know. And I was just like, it, it sat really funny with me because it's like here I am writing this book to show people this is how bad it looks to me. We have had genocides throughout history I and mean, we're kind of living through one right now. I guess I, I do this, uh, unfortunately, when I overgeneralize. I'm saying like there were a... a number of conspiracy researchers who I heard questioning the value of putting out a dystopian story as it would relate to what the New World Order would really want. And something that we were trying to maybe expose this future. Like It's amazing to me, like, you could watch a movie where the bad guys call for a New World Order, and then people jumped up and down and go, Oh look! This movie is calling for a new world order. It's like no, they made them the bad guys. They made them the bad guys. You're not supposed to like them. You're supposed to respect, you know, like uh, associate with the people who are trying to overthrow them. Regardless, you know, we could play that a number of different ways because there's when I when I get to the idea of what what impact when we talk about this idea of authorizing your own reality and authorizing your future. The idea of writing this dystopian book has a weird impact on me because there were things about it that, while it was definitely a it, based on what was really happening and certain sort of common sense, um, you know, not like predictions in the sense of like, oh, let me make a prediction, but you know, you're extrapolating an extrapolated future. Well, if this is how bad it is right now, then it's sort of, this is, this is how it could play out. Well, then things started happening that were really sinky with what I was writing. And even, um, uh, I highly recommend Grant Morrison, who's an interesting character. Grant Morrison has a lecture that he gave at a disinfo conference. So if you just type Grant Morrison disinfo, a fantastic, fantastic speech where what he's saying, he's a comic book writer. He was very, very powerful in a sense that he uh, just recently, he was one of the head writers at DC Comics. But he's a comic book writer known for writing all these interesting things, and he was trying to tell a story, same thing, same experience I had, but to him it was actually happened more, he felt more of an impact, and maybe that's because he had a wider readership, I don't know. You get into the idea of sigil magic and how this actually would play out. 
But to say he, he found he's writing the story about these things and then, hey, all this starts to happen. And that he actually started meeting people that were exactly – looked exactly like were in his comic. So then he tried an experiment and he wanted to meet some woman who looked like such and such. So he works into the story a woman who looks like that and he meets a woman who looks like that. And he starts playing with it that he's writing something as a magical act that he's actually – creating a world based on what he's writing. And again, this is the idea of realizing you're in the book and then realizing you're the author of the book. Now, what we have to consider is how many people haven't figured that out yet. Every aspiring Hollywood actor or aspiring Hollywood scriptwriter, do you think they have any clue that they're like – influencing reality with their writing no i i don't think so if you if you met some of these people i guarantee you they're clueless uh you know it's not to say everyone's clueless but there are some really clueless people who are just hungry for you know hey i want to work in movies or whatever so the, the point is that these murals could be someone's very well-intentioned uh idea of saying this is what we're coming out of and we would like and this is an extrapolated future of what you know these these horrible catastrophes happening all around the world and we can we have to figure out a way to overcome that it's sort of like a you know a comic book in the sense that sequential art these murals play out a sequence so I, i can't look at these without thinking about grant morrison because the question comes the, people, the conspiracy people who want to say this is some New World Order wet dream, that they this is the future they want, well, it would be really hard to tell which is which because if you wanted to create a future like that, essentially you would write that story. Uh, you would try and imbue that authorization. You would write your story the way you want it to be, where you are the you know sadistic ruler of a defeated planet. At the same time, if you wanted to be a guy, a good guy like like myself, I feel like I was a pretty good guy and I wanted to tell a story about liberating people. I'm writing a story, being realistic, saying, hey, here's this dystopian future and with all these horrible, sadistic elite and here's how we can try and overcome them. Essentially, you could write that same story coming from either intention And again, it sort of all reminds me just to come back to the idea of realizing what power we have when we create an artwork, also questioning what are we really tapping into. And then, of course, you know, the Denver International Airport is one of the most obvious questions is like, what is the intention that goes into it? But just to say, I mean, it's sort of these questions are really hard to answer because essentially the good guy and the bad guy could kind of write the same story. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if, you, if you wanted to write that New World Order wet dream or if you wanted to write the story where the New World Order is, is overcome, you kind of write a similar premise. I mean, you, there's the fact that Orwell was actually financed in writing 1984 by the Rockefellers. Yeah, that's a little piece of interesting history that throws a big question mark onto everything. You know, so what what would the reason for that be, right? Why why would these guys be into supporting this this work of art? I, I can't think about that story though. You know, Orwell when he was writing that story, it almost killed him. And I'll be honest, when I was writing uh, Look at All the Happy Creatures, which is not nowhere near as well written, but I certainly put a lot of energy and emotion into it. And that book made me sick. Like, it really took a lot out of me, uh, physically, spiritually, to, to exist in those really dark head spaces and to live in this world that I was creating took a huge thing out of me. And I, whenever I hear the story of uh, Orwell getting sick while writing 1984 and that he was getting pushed on by the Rockefellers who would give him a little bit more money and tell him to keep going, I can't help but think of, uh, you know the movie Amadeus? Yes. Where the movie essentially ends, right, with how, how is he killed? It's like he's given, you have to write the most dark, disturbing, emotionally painful 
piece of artwork that you possibly can and you're just keep pushing through it, keep pushing through it. You'll, you have, you know, and it's this idea that that was essentially killed him. And I, I just, I keep thinking back to uh, all these things kind of jumbled together in my mind a little bit. But, uh, when I think of the Orwell story, I, I definitely think of Amadeus, but just my, my own personal experiences. And I, I feel like if someone wants to dive deeper into this conversation, I, I, I do recommend uh, the Grant Morrison to Simpo speech. It's, it's actually, if, if nothing else, it's fascinating food for thought. Well, thank you. That's really interesting, and I appreciate um, that uh, link to him. Thank you. Alan, tell us about other events in which you were involved and where one can purchase your books. Oh, thank you. My website is syncbookpress.com, or you can go to thesyncbook.com. I should point out that sync, we're spelling S-Y-N-C. A lot of people are either adding or adding an H at the end. It's just S-Y-N-C, so we can do syncbookpress.com or thesyncbook.com. My own website is allthehappycreatures.com. Um, we have done live event. We actually did a live event last January that I was explaining to you guys before, uh, Bill Klaus's, what he calls the Kubrick Transformer. We showed part of that on a big screen. We had people giving slideshows, different uh, presentations of their information uh, for synchromysticism. And then some people who make, like a gentleman named Kevin Halcott, who makes videos based on exploring different synchromistic threads. Uh, he showed a video. Things like that. My, my wife danced. We had a dance segment. We had a gentleman, Andros Jones, who, who wrote the book uh, Accidental Initiations and who contributed to the first sync book. He does a show called Radio 8 Ball, and we incorporated Andros's format into our live synchromysticism event. And, you know, we talked about what are the applications of synchronicity. Well, there's this idea of spiritual development. There's the idea of perhaps being able to better discern our conspiracy research. But something that probably nearer and dearer to my heart is you can use it to create art with. And a gentleman like Andras and Bill and David Plate, uh, these guys who are you taking synchronicity and making artwork with it, it just really speaks to my heart, and it's just this other area that I just, I just want to see more and more of it. I, I love it. This completes part two of three of our continuing conversation with Alan Green. <laughs>